I, I uh, think I will start with a short, uh, a brief historic background. Um, the Estonia and Latvia and, and also Lithuania suffered uh, three uh, occupations during the Second World War. Uh, they were annexed by the USSR in the summer of 1940. Uh, and then the following year, uh, they were occupied by uh, Germany. And then uh, in 1944, reoccupied uh, by the Soviet forces. So, and this situation triggered a stream of refugees, uh, which peaked in 1944. Uh, in the autumn, uh, due to, to the advancing battlefront and the, <coughs> the um, Soviet um, power advancing. So more than 30,000 people uh, escaped to Sweden. Some crossed straight over to, um, to the Swedish mainland, as you can see, and others went uh, via Finland and the Åland Islands. Uh, and uh, quite many went... Uh, to Gotland, a big island in the middle of the Baltic Sea, as you can see. Uh, <clears throat> also, thousands of refugees were lost at sea. Nobody really knows how many. Uh, and this escape has, of course, left traces. Um, that's what I do in my PhD project. But um, there are some traces of uh, camps where the refugees got to stay at arrival. And there are some monuments and also graves in Swedish and, and uh, Finnish coastal areas where drowned refugees were washed ashore. Uh, but uh, in this pre presentation, I will focus on uh, boats and arms and uh, discuss how they mirror those conflicts going on. <clears throat> and I consider those to be like bi biographical objects that are very effective and carry with them those um, experiences of forced migration and, and uh, border crossing experience, and I think archaeology is a great way to, to shed light on issues like that. Uh, I try to cooperate with the museum also to reach out a little bit on this subject. Well, after the war, there were about 800 refugee boats from those countries left in Sweden. Uh, some of them had made several trips back and forth over the sea. And as you can see on this picture, many of them were tiny, really open vessels, small fishing boats. Uh, but quite often they had been uh, prepared to, to make it over the sea. So they had some extra planking in the hull, as you can see, and funny little cabins to provide some shelters. And so on. some even had um, car engines installed, as you can see up to the right there. So I think it is really remarkable evidence of the desperation and also the ingenuity, I think, of the people escaping over the sea in the autumn. Uh, <clears throat> and after the war, uh, all those boats were repatriated by the Soviet Union and uh, it seems destroyed, uh, with very few exceptions. So the situation today is that there are hardly any traditional oh, <laughs> Estonian or Latvian uh, boats uh, left today in those countries. The few ones that do exist uh, are the ones that... Sorry? It's not, not a fire going on or something? <laughs> no. ah. Anyway, <clears throat> there are a few ones left in Sweden. The, the ones that were, for different reasons, never repatriated. Uh, and these are the ones that I, I'm working with. I will give you a few examples. Uh, this is what they often look like today. Uh, I found about 30 or 40 of them. Uh, they were not only fishing boats, but uh, all kinds of boats really that uh, could be found. Uh, this one is a, a lifeboat. Um, a Russian prom of some kind. Um, and there were also military boats like this um, small um, storm boat or assault boat or whatever. And quite often the, the boats were destroyed the, deliberately in order to prevent people from escaping. So this one has, as you can see, obviously it has been shot at. You can see the small holes and how they have been, been uh, plugged and plated so in order to make it over the sea. Uh, this is another 
<clears throat> boat that was shot at during the crossing. Uh, it's it, uh, it's a fast going boat, so it was used by um, the ref refugee smugglers in cooperation with the Swedish Secret Service and also the uh, War Refugee Board to try to evacuate people and also collect some information. It too has uh, holes that are plugged in the side of it. Uh, but it is in mint condition still, as you can see. Uh, I'm also interested in what kind of things that people brought with them during these extreme circumstances in those small boats. And um, I've found that uh, quite often people brought arm, arms, guns and weapons of different kinds, uh, all kinds really, both uh, modern and antique. Like, for example, this uh, boat, uh, the family traveling with this one brought a uh, hunting rifle along with some other things for self-provision, like fishing nets and uh, sewing machines and so on. Uh, and uh, I have also found out that the material culture often played a very vital role during the crossing. And one example of this is, um, well, this history, the history of this boat. There were five young Estonians escaping on this one, uh, including the two twin sisters. You can see there they were hiding in the cabin. Uh, and um, one of the guys, he carried a gun in his pocket. And this turned out, it, it affected the compass. So they got completely lost at sea. They were aimed for an area called Roslagen, north of Stockholm in Sweden. but they. After several days at sea, they, uh, they landed quite further south in another country. This because of this gun in the pocket. Uh, so it turned out to even to have an impact on, on where those people settled down in the end in Sweden. They uh, stayed at this island where they, they landed. Uh, also, uh, when this guy who carried the gun um, when he learned that he had reached the Swedish coast, that they were in Swedish territorial waters, he uh, threw, he tossed his gun into the sea. And that, I think, is a bit interesting because there are numerous examples of this, uh, this gesture of tossing the weapons into the sea. It, there are so many stories about it, so I, I think there must be hundreds of guns on the sea floor <laughs> outside the Swedish coast. Um, Armour weapons were also brought at large numbers. They were, of course, uh, collected by and confiscated by the Swedish uh, military, and uh, most of them are not uh, are not left today. There are some uh, some in museum collections, and as, as you can see, there are lots of uh, German and also uh, Russian army guns. So, but um, this one, I think, is also fascinating for the rifle in the middle there. It's an, uh, a Japanese army rifle in Arisaka from, well, from Japan. And, and uh, this was found uh, in a small isolated island called Sjöker in the Åland, the Finnish uh, archipelago in the Åland Islands. And, and uh, quite, quite a few refugees um, took this old medieval sea road to Sweden and rested on this island and got some uh, food and some uh, road guidance and so on by, by the local com community. Uh, and I think it's kind of fascinating how this um, Japanese army rifle have ended up in a small seal hunting and fishing community in the middle of the Baltic Sea. And I'm quite sure it has to do with the refugees because when they moved on, they often left uh, guns as a gift to the people that taking care of them for some days. Um, so <clears throat> why did people bring all those guns and arms? Well, some, of course, brought them because they represented a, a value that could be used for hunting or sold or something like that. Uh, some people had here hidden in the forests for several months and boarded directly from there. Uh, it did happen that they had to shoot at coast guards or uh, overpower the crew of a vessel in order to, to force it to, to set course to Sweden. Uh, also, I found out that uh, sometimes those guns were actually aimed at the 
refugees themselves. I, I spoke to a man who was involved in the human smuggling network, trying to evacuate people from Latvia and uh, Estonia. And he told me he brought a gun on those trips in order to prevent the boat from sinking. Uh, he um, some, Sometimes he had to stop uh, people from boarding an already overloaded boat. And he had to force people to sit down uh, when sighting the Swedish coast so they would not rock the boat. And also he, he had to force people to toss their coats overboard because they refused just to bundle up. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> when at sea, the, this, um, the clothes would get soaked and this would cause a lot of extra weight. Uh, also, um, there are evidence that uh, the refugees made pact, pacts with each other that if the escape was not to succeed, if, if the boat uh, was about to sink, they would shoot each other, uh, and um, also if caught by, by uh, enemies, uh, suicide was considered a, a way to, it could be a way to protect companions, not to give, give up secrets that could hurt the resistant movement. So, so we were asked by the organizers to, to discuss what the discipline can achieve on a transnational level. And uh, drawing from my research, I, I've made a few observations. First, there are a lot of things going on um, in between these nations, outside the territorial borders. There are lots of vessels and nations interacting with each other. Uh, so it's not an empty space where nothing happens. And uh, it is my belief also that the most of the traces of this escape are probably to be found on the sea floor, uh, considering the many tra tragedies at sea and also how people had to throw um, luggage and stuff overboard. And as you know, the uh, preservation conditions are really great in the Baltic Sea, for preserving organic material. Uh, also, it has uh, struck me that Boat refugees are a um, recurrent phenomenon in history, uh, but um, it seems that people don't really think about this. Uh, um, most people in Sweden today have not really heard of this history, and uh, uh, well, it's a big debate going on now about uh, migration, uh, but um, well, Sweden, the, the fact that Sweden was a country of first arrival and, and uh, this situation was sorted out in spite of uh, food shortages and uh, lack of routines and so on, that's not really part of the discussion. I think archaeology is a, a great way to shed light on such is issues as well. And I, I found that, um, I think it's a bit interesting that uh, um, outside the battlefields and so on, there are other material and arms are distributed in slightly new new ways of which we don't really have much knowledge uh, and also the new kind of conflicts emerging like the the need to count on passengers or even to to kill yourself or maybe your family and uh, conflicts i think they mess a little bit with the material culture like the general order of things uh, there are new distribution patterns and, and so on like you can find small traditional uh, Estonian fishing boats on the open sea where they were never meant to operate or, or end up in the Swedish east coast. Uh, there are those bit uh, unconventional linkings like fishing boats and army weapons, for example. And uh, finally, I found that uh, this uh, heritage, heritage, it's not really cared for in Sweden at the national level anyway. <coughs> But it definitely is in Latvia and, and Estonia. An example there is a refugee boat that were brought from Sweden and is put on display at the seaplane harbor in, in Tallinn today. There's another one right next to it that was used as a sandbox in Sweden for children to play in. Uh, <laughs> so, <clears throat> but the knowledge of the existence of these remains is quite poor, I think, on both sides of the Baltic seas. Uh, so, I think that a tr transnational take on conflict archaeology is uh, quite um, necessary for exploring themes like this. So, that's it. Thanks.